So hi everyone, I am uh, Shashi uh, from Julia Computing. Uh, so we, uh, we work on products related to a language called Julia, um, which I, uh, so this workshop is about the Julia programming language. I will talk a little bit about why, uh, why Julia is important uh, for data science and uh, um, you know, g computing in general in the future. Right, so, um, and then uh, uh, I will give you like a basic introduction to Julia in uh, interactive notebook kind of interface. <coughs> so yeah, let's dive in. Uh, so, Julia is a fresh approach to data science and numerical computing. We uh, basically uh, said all the uh, tools that are available now cannot be fixed, and we need a new language to. Uh, you know, fix all these problems. So, <coughs> so uh, this is the uh, scenario in the last 25 years. We have uh, high level languages like Python, R, SAS, MATLAB um, and, and so on. So scientists use these languages to prototype their algorithms, right? And they hand these algorithms to computer scientists who rewrite the algorithm in C and C++ for speed or for running it in embedded devices like the Arduino or uh, the ARM processor or, or so on. Um, and then people deploy it. So there is this divide between the scientist and the programmer. So uh, one, <coughs> the computer, uh, the programmer uh, has expertise in lower level languages and uh, uh, scientist has expertise in uh, science and higher level languages and it is kind of uh, it impedes you know prog uh, fast development when there is like this gap between the two groups of people in the organization. So how does Julia solve this problem? So we call this a two language problem. Julia solves this problem by just being easy to use and, and at the same time fast as C or C++ or Java. So uh, it might be hard to believe that it is both easy to use and uh, fast like the low level languages but I will show you how and why it is so. Uh, so this basically converges the programmer and the scientist into one entity. So uh, we have increasingly seen in Julia uh, scientists from varied field like varied fields like biology, neuroscience, uh, physics. They come to Julia, try to use it. Uh, they come to Julia from Python or MATLAB and they start using it and they get like so involved in it that they uh, try to understand the internals of Julia because it is easy to read and all that and they start contributing to Julia and soon they are computer scientists right. So, so that is what we have seen uh, uh, increasingly. So, so w w w what, what does Julia actually do? Uh, so this is the landscape of all the uh, technical computing languages uh, R, MATLAB, SciPy. Uh, not technically a language, but still a language of its own inside Python, Mathematica, Maple and so on. Um, so uh, like I said, this is also talking about the, the uh, di uh, dichotomy between the scientist and the programmer. Uh, so business as, you, as usual, like you cannot fix these languages to run fast. Like there have been efforts to fix Python, for example, uh, in, in Cython, uh, but it has uh, often uh, not made much progress because the language has so many impediments to making it fast. Um, so here are some performance numbers from some micro benchmarks. So what this plot shows is uh, 10 to the power 0 uh, that is 1, that is the speed of C, that is the time it took to run the program in C. So you can, you can basically consider C as uh, assembly with some syntactic sugar, right. So when you write something in C, it is as fast as it is going to be. So this is one. So uh, all the other dots are various benchmarks depending on the color and these are languages and the dots represent how far away from C they are and this is an exponential graph. So if, if a dot is here, that means it was 10,000 times lower than C, right. So you can see Julia performs very close to C uh, within factor of 2 of C. And uh, some of these benchmark, benchmarks after getting updated, more of them are below C. So it is actually slightly faster than C uh, for, for compiler optimization reasons. 
uh, we, we tested this on GCC actually and uh, uh, you can see that uh, some of the Mathematica benchmarks are 100 times slow, uh, Python 10 times, 20 times slower and uh, Octave is really slow, uh, <coughs> MATLAB is also uh, pretty slow. Uh, <coughs> these benchmarks, some of these benchmarks are designed to actually uh, use the, uh, the languages fast libraries, some of them are not, some of them are just designed to use the language itself to implement a new algorithm. Um, so, Julia performs consistently good. Uh, a real world example is uh, this Gillespie model that they use in drug discovery. Uh, so, they simulate a, a large number of uh, uh, combinations of molecules and then um, uh, figure out what is the, what is the optimal combination to uh, or dosage for for a given disease. So, th these are performance numbers uh, in milliseconds for various implementations of the same thing, uh, hard coded. Uh, uh, so, there is a package called GLSP SSA in R uh, and then it was rewritten in Julia uh, called GLSP.jl. Julia has this convention of suffixing .jl for all packages. So, you can see uh, what runs in one millisecond takes about a se second in R. Anyway, so this is some media coverage we have been getting. Um, Julia is poised to become one of the leading tools deployed by developers and programmers at banks, hedge funds, regulators and vendors. This is a magazine for quants, quantitative analysis people uh, on the Wall Street and so on. And this is uh, Cooper Tires, uh, your Kindle serious excitement, uh, I am working towards replacing some MATLAB code and so on. So, this is the map of Julia sort of, uh, where Julia is being used uh, or developed from. Uh, I think these are uh, GitHub activities, uh, GitHub activity, uh, this is plotting the GitHub activity. So, people contributing to Julia uh, based projects on GitHub. So, you can see uh, there is a strong presence in Bangalore, that is Julia Computing Bangalore, uh, I think and some more people uh, in Chennai. And uh, we have a strong presence in the east and west coast of USA and then some in uh, Europe and, and around the world basically and Japan and this may be. Uh, so, this is uh, we had our uh, Julia Con in June in UC Berkeley. Uh, this is all the developers who have uh, attended. Uh, you can see that they are really happy to be using Julia. Um, so, we, we, uh, we have been gaining traction across industries. So, uh, we have uh, 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 we have presence in finance industry, uh, engineering, um, IoT and 3D printing and, and a lot more uh, including uh, um, medical imaging and so on. So, in New York Fed, uh, the Federal Reserve uh, uses uh, Julia for their uh, DSGE modeling, I am not sure what that is, but you can look that up. Um, and FAA uses Julia for uh, their model of uh, aircraft collision avoidance. So, uh, if you are traveling in, a, in, in an aircraft and you see another aircraft next to you, uh, you should be thankful to Julia for not hitting the other aircraft, uh, because those models are written in Julia. Um, and uh, there is a lab at UC Berkeley working on IoT. Uh, they, they make self driving cars uh, which are wireless and uh, Julia actually runs on the embedded device on, on the car. Um, and then uh, Voxelate is using uh, Julia to 3D print quadcopters um, which is a pretty IoT application. Um, so, these are some of the organizations using it. You can see uh, um, BlackRock, uh, Conning, these are all quantitative finance. Uh, people and then Intel uses it. Uh, Trinity Health is a healthcare institute. Uh, Aviva is another qualitative, quantitative, and Invenia does uh, consulting for power grids and and other companies. Voxelate is here, Stanford, MIT, uh, GE, and so on. Uh, and Berkeley National Labs. I'll show you uh, a very cool application they did at the Berkeley National Lab. Uh, the, so, just to, to plug our products, in the, so this, this, these are the products we have, 
uh, Julia Pro is the, is the Julia is itself open source and we have about 600 contributors from around the world working on Julia at any given time. Uh, uh, so Julia Pro is the packaging of Julia which comes with Julia the main compiler plus uh, a bunch of packages I think a hundred or so packages which we uh, maintain and provide support for. Um, so it contains uh, pa packages for plotting, for doing statistics, uh, for doing machine learning, for for doing uh, for data frames and database interaction and so on. So if if you knew our organization, you want to start using Julia. I think Julia Pro is the way to go because uh, you get more out out of the box like uh, from Julia, Julia Pro than just installing Julia and doing everything yourself. And uh, secondly, we have Julia Box, which is our cloud-based uh, Julia offering. So you can go to Google and search Julia Box. Uh, or go to juliabox.com and you can log in with your Google account and start running Julia in, in the browser itself. Uh, we actually provide the IPython notebook interface which, which lets you write code in the browser and see the output there itself. I will show you some of that here. Uh, Julia Run is uh, a product uh, which helps you deploy Julia on the cloud. So we, we can currently uh, deploy any project you have using Julia Run uh, on AWS, uh, Amazon, uh, 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 Microsoft Azure and uh, Google Cloud Platform. Nishant here is one of the developers of Julia Box and Julia Run. Um, and uh, Julia Finn is uh, specifically tailored for the finance crowd. Uh, so we have a financial modeling lang uh, sub language sort of DSL uh, in, in this package and another database uh, called Julia DB. Which is uh, which is good at time series kind of data. Um, so, so I'll talk a little bit about how Julia is uh, making uh, drastic changes. Like it's being a game changer in one domain. That I, uh, and I'll give the example of uh, machine learning. Uh, so, the state of the art in machine learning is uh, uh, MXNet, Cafe, Torch, and TensorFlow. And each of these, I, I, we have a, uh, we, we think that every uh, machine learning package um, has a, a poorly written, incomplete, and buggy implementation of a programming language. So if you look at TensorFlow and like go through all the API, they provide APIs for everything that a programming language should be doing. Um, that is because they just uh, give you the syntax in Python, but everything runs on in C++, right? So. Uh, you actually, uh, the more and more you develop your uh, uh, deep learning package, you end up having to write a programming language which can handle uh, fast arrays and so on. So Julia solves that problem by being one language which is, which is both high level and fast like I said in the beginning. Um, so, um, so in Julia you can write a single program and run it on uh, any hardware you can imagine uh, that that is uh, quite popular right so um, so we uh, some people call it call julia like executable math so uh, you can write literally the formulas that you take from deep learning papers in julia and then get it to work on uh, on all these hardware so it runs on a number of intel uh, Intel processors, i7, Knights Landing, uh, and it runs on GPUs. There is an organization called Julia GPU which develops GPU support, uh, a a NVIDIA and OpenCL. It also runs on ARM which is what runs on all the embedded devices. It runs on power, open power architecture and this is uh, our Julia cloud offering. Um, so it, you, can you can run it without any computers on the cloud. Uh, so yeah, so this is one application that uh, uh, was done by uh, the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in the UC Berkeley. So what I did was they, they have 178 terabytes of, uh, of uh, pictures of the sky from various telescopes around the world and uh, in space. Uh, so the problem they tried to solve is 
uh, they have a, a data set where people have labeled this object is a star, this object is a nebula, this object is a uh, galaxy and so on. So they wanted to process this 178 terabytes of data and figure out uh, using the labeled data what are all the objects in the sky. So basically cataloging everything in the sky that is what uh, they use Julia for. So this, this uh, experiment was the first ever to uh, reach a petaflop per second. I think a peta is 10 to the power 15, uh, 15 yeah. So teraflop and petaflop. So that means that uh, it, it was able to do 10 to the power 15 floating point operations per second on this huge supercomputer called uh, NERSC uh, at, at NERSC. Uh, I think it is called Cori. Um, how many cores was it? It's, it, it has hundreds of thousands of cores. Uh, so Julia is the only uh, dynamic language to be used for a purpose like this. Uh, that is uh, a big deal. Okay, so we, we, this is one of the other applications that Julia Computing is taking up with uh, Drishti hospitals. So, uh, uh, so they have this device which can take the picture of a retina very easily uh, for cheap. So we are writing deep learning packages to uh, detect uh, if, if, if someone has some kind of disease. You can, uh, you can actually tell uh, if, if a person has diabetes for example by looking at their retina so on and a number of other diseases. Okay, this slide should have come before that. Anyway, so these are the popular machine learning frameworks uh, and the, we have wrappers for all of these in Julia I, I, because we can call Python so easily and uh, there are pure Julia implementations as well, mocha.jl and merlin.jl are some of them and there is another one which is coming up called flux.jl which is developed by Julia Computing itself. Um, so another company Bestex uses it for forex trading. So they do arbitrage uh, with uh, with their data, and they use Julia uh, to provide uh, to power their post trade transaction cost analysis, um, precision medicine, medicine. So there's a company called Path Bio Analytics which is using Julia. Uh, uh, this is again a drug discovery kind of project. Um, so where they figure out what is uh, the optimal amount of drugs to give to a person with a certain illness because these drugs actually cost millions of dollars over the lifetime of a person. So, uh, so uh, to, to end this uh, non-technical part of the presentation, I would like to quote Paul Graham from y, y Combinator. If you have a choice of several languages, it is all, all other things being equal, a mistake to programming and a program in anything but the most powerful one. So I, th I think Julia is the most powerful language in the space uh, and, and only uh, if you start using it you will learn it every day. Uh, I mean you will see this every day in your work. So with that. Does anyone have any questions about uh, what Julia Computing does, what Julia is, um, and like general, yeah. It has to be written in some language, right? Then you know some like, how is it the relevant and what is the deciding? Yeah, sure. Uh, you mean Julia itself has to be written in some language. Okay, well, um, so Julia, 70% of Julia is actually written in Julia and the rest 30% is C and Lisp. So, um, so yeah, we, we bootstrap to a certain extent and then build everything up on, uh, with Julia. So, um, okay, where, where is my basic start? Okay. okay, so, so these are some of the features of Julia. Uh, it says bulleted list. Um, I guess I will just read it out. Uh, it is dynamically typed. Uh, there is something called multiple dispatch which is sort of a generalization of object oriented programming. Um, we have meta programming uh, that means that pro uh, we can write programs that create more programs. Uh, this is very common in Lisp but was like sort of a lost art after 
uh, Lisp stopped becoming really popular. Um, but we have brought it back in, in, in Julia. We have uh, perfectly hygienic macros uh, in, in Julia. So we can write programs that create programs. So this, this is, uh, finds use in a lot of domains. Uh, so you can directly call C functions or Python functions from Julia. So this means that if you have some code written in C or Python, you do not have to entirely uh, throw it away. Uh, you can just call it from Julia while you start using Julia. Um, if we have uh, coroutines and asynchronous uh, IO just like Go if you know about it. Um, Julia is designed for Unicode, there is excellent Unicode support. You can write code with Unicode characters in it. Uh, you have string support for Unicode and so on. And we, uh, Julia has built in distributed memory parallelism which means if you have a computer or a cluster you can start writing code that runs on all of them. Um, um, user defined types are no different from built in types which is what makes uh, Julia sort of uh, a, a able to bootstrap itself from, from scratch. So we actually define the integer type in Julia and uh, work with it. Uh, uh, so it has a large built in library for doing common data analysis uh, analysis uh, chores. So we have regular expression, linear algebra and so on. So in a traditional uh, data science stack you will see some surprising languages like Perl and Ruby as well because uh, you want to process some text data and the best tool there is uh, uh, Perl. So people write some Perl script which others cannot read um, and so on. You can just do all those in Julia. Um, so we have a git based package manager which makes package development uh, really, really easy. So all packages are hosted on GitHub or some GitHub uh, Git thing. So you can just go there open issues. Uh, so this notebook was created by Steve Johnson at MIT uh, who is also a huge contributor to Julia. Um, anyway, so I will start off with, uh, with the basics. So this is, how, uh, this is what Julia code looks like. The first line of Julia code is A equals RAND 10 comma 300 I guess. So this creates an array which has 10 rows and 300 columns. You, you see these dot dot dots that means there are more columns but yeah these are these are random numbers uh, created like this. And we have the normal mathematical operators. This backward slash means solve, um, solve for x given a and b. Uh, so this will actually give you a vector. So it's solving the vector, sol solving for x. Uh, and you can do a transpose times a and the syntax looks almost like math. So th that's, that's how arrays look. This is how strings look. So, so this here is a string. And, and it says alpha is a Greek, Greek letter and you can, you can write this is a regular expression uh, prefix with R um, and you can match it for example. It just works out of the box and you can have Unicode characters as variable names for example this and you can write, write it like this. So if you write alpha and press tab it will become the alpha character and then I think it is a hat and then you can write underscore 2 and then prime. So that is a single variable now and it is called we can set it to 42 and then use it, use it in our code. So this is a cute feature that people like. Um, you can also have Unicode uh, operators, infix operators. Some of the characters in Unicode are parsed as infix operators. So you, we are defining a function called much less than x comma y and it, its definition, definition is this, is it, is it less than one tenth of y, uh, that is the definition and uh, you can run it. Um, you can, another example of defining a Unicode operator called the Kronecker product. Um, okay, so that is Unicode and like basic stuff. 
uh, here is how you define a function there are actually three ways of defining a function the first one is the verbose form this can have many lines so I can write uh, uh, x plus 42 here or and so on like I can write I can call uh, I can print something and, and so on here uh, and this is the one line form so if your function is small enough you can write it in one line you say foo of x equals x plus 1 and then uh, this is the anonymous function so this means that this function does not have a name so but you can use it in any function which takes which takes which takes a function as an input so here I am passing it to map so what map does is it takes a list of numbers or any anything and then applies a function to it so I am applying this little function here to every element there so it is adding 1 to every element. So here I am just calling the function we defined above. So uh, one of the so here is where I am going to talk about why Julia is fast. So when you call foo3 for the first time what happens is uh, it compiles the function foo for for the input type integer. So our definition of foo is here it is x equals x plus 1 so this compiled it for integers and then the second time I call it it uses the cached compiled code so uh, and this and if I call the same function with a different type like a floating point number here 7.3 it will compile it again but if I call it again it will use the cached code for floating point inputs okay um, and it also works since plus is defined for arrays it will work for arrays so you can write generic code like this. Um, so I will also show you what code it generates so you can you can actually inspect what code uh, gets generated by calling this function called code native uh, pass the function itself as the first argument and a tuple of types as the second argument I will show you the assembly code it generates so this this le lets you look at your own code and uh, see what it is doing under the hood so you can figure out if there are any uh, performance deficiencies and ask us uh, why this is happening and hmm? oh um, mine is some intel uh, i7 I why do you ask yeah yeah all oh, right so I did not tell them about tell you about uh, how this code is actually getting executed so this is called a Jupyter notebook um, so what you can you can create these code cells if you press that plus button uh, it is it is like a web server which is running in my browser actually uh, but it has a Julia backend on my computer itself yeah so if I write 2 plus 2 it will send that code to Julia and Julia will execute it and send the result back and I think I can also like print colors and stuff uh, or is it I do not know I, I forgot how this is done so if you return some object which has a special representation it will print that. Uh, so, okay. so so uh, I, I keep saying that Julia is fast uh, I guess the first question to answer is uh, is Julia really fast and if so why is it fast right so this is a notebook which we made just to show that um, uh, yeah so so here we are uh, we'll be working with this simple function sum of a which sums numbers uh, in an array uh, from 1 to n right so I will create the array of uh, 10,000 random numbers 10 million random numbers 10 to the power 7 and 
this is the function which does it uh, does the sum uh, expected result is 0 0.5 into 10 to the power 7. So, you can see if it is correct first before you see if it is fast uh, it is it is close to 0 0.5 into 10 to the power 7 uh, 5 million. Uh, so, I will include this benchmark measuring package. So, here I am creating a C function which does the same thing right. So, this is actually Julia string C code inside a Julia string and then I am creating a I am compiling it using GCC. So, this back tick syntax is used for calling the OS, OS uh, I mean the shell commands basically. So, I am calling GCC to compile it. Uh, and I am wrapping it to call from Julia. So, this C call function will call my C sum function in C ok. So, this function takes the number of elements and a vector of numbers. So, I will pass my array to the C sum function and it called the C code and that ran it. We can check to see if they are equal this approximate symbol make uh, compares them approximately there will be like floating point differences between C and uh, uh, Julia which is a cellular VM. So, if you do equals equals it might be false, but it is approximately equal. Uh, so, you can you can see what, what is up what uh, this is this is uh, uh, the name for the is approx function and if you see what is is approx it will tell you the tolerance is like square root of epsilon and epsilon is this 10 to the power minus 16 um, and square root of that will be um, 10 to the power minus 8 or something. Um, so, if you so this benchmark macro comes from the benchmark tools package you can give it any expression Julia expression and it will run it many times and uh, and show you what was the median time what was the mean time and what was the maximum time. So, we, we just ran the C function and there were no allocations and it ran in about 11 seconds 11 milliseconds. Uh, fastest time was 11.947. So, we will uh, Okay, now we will compare compare the same thing in python okay. so there is this package called pycall which 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 you can use to call python from julia and i'm loading that um, so first we will benchmark the built in sum function in python. So, there is a sum function which comes by default in python. So, we will check to see first if it is correct and then go on to benchmark it. Okay, so by default it is like 62 milliseconds compared to 11 milliseconds in C and we will put that in the dictionary of values that we are collecting and next we are compi uh, comparing the speed of numpy dot sum. That is 4.297 milliseconds it is faster than C this is because it is it is making use of simd. So, in C code we did not have any simd things. So, sim what simd means is single instru instruction multiple data. Uh, so, modern processors come with uh, the ability to run multiple instructions at a time. So, if you write a simple for loop it is not going to do it um, it will just do everything serially, but if you write some sim simd in intrinsics it is going to try and do it. So, uh, we guess the sum uh, numpy code is doing that. So, that is good 
finally we will define our own python function which does the sum um, and run that so we call yeah uh, that's about uh, 300 milliseconds uh, co compare this to c uh, which was 11 milliseconds next we will write the julia code so julia's built in sum function it should hopefully perform the same as numpy <laughs> yeah so 4 point something milliseconds so to be fair we are collecting all the minimum values here and you can see the comparison um, so the next one is a hand written function in julia you can see that this is similar to what we wrote in python so there is nothing to not understand in this code because it looks like pseudo code so you can just say uh, so s you, we are initializing s to 0, 0.0 and uh, going through all the values in a and adding it to the it to s and then returning s so in julia you don't have to say return s uh, just like in ruby or whatever um, let's benchmark this and this should hopefully be similar to c speed or actually slower because we we are also doing bounds checking here but yeah 1 millisecond slower than c um, okay let's collect that in your list of uh, In, the, in our list of timings so here is the summary right so Julia can perform handwritten Julia can perform the same as C but I can make it faster if you want uh, so if I just went here and said inbounds I think it will just be, become faster Okay, uh, maybe I have to re remove it and write it, uh, write the longer version. Anyway, so you can you can see that handwritten Julia performs similar to C, uh, um, and handwritten Python, for example, is how many times? Um, it's about thirty times slower. Something like that. Okay, yeah. So this is sort of why Julia is. So you can, uh, it's kind of a small proof that Julia is fast. Uh, where is my other notebook? Okay. Shall I do some industrial application thing? Okay. Okay. So, um, how many of you here uh, are actually programmers? Or, okay. Okay. Most of you. Awesome. And how many of you have you heard of Julia or used Julia before? Okay. One person. Okay. Cool. I hope uh, more of you guys will go and try it out. At least go through the documentation and see uh, for yourself that it's a beautiful language uh, so uh, we can uh, so wh what are people interested in uh, do you guys want to see some uh, machine learning application or something like that or do you want to know more about the features of julia iot data okay um, so uh, IoT data means so it's already in your big computer or is it on the embedded system? Uh, what kind of data are you talking about? Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, 
So Abhijit is going to show you next some uh, how to work with some uh, tabular data, right? That's pretty much what you would like to do. Um, I will let him do that, and maybe we can see some uh, some real time streaming type of stuff later if there is time. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, I won't do this. You you do it, but first I'll do this, and then you. Okay. Okay, I'll take out my laptop. Thanks. About one uh, real example or real uh, industrial use case uh, with a very large uh, German car manufacturing unit in India, uh, Volkswagen. Uh, they are uh, uh, there's a company called as Asia Engineering. I mean, we as Julia Computing, we are not doing this, but like I'm personally advising this company called as Asia Engineering in Bangalore, which is helping Volkswagen with the transition towards uh, Industry 4.0. They are like uh, automating the entire assembly line of these uh, around 800 cars being manufactured daily. Uh, yeah, so it involves a lot of like you know a combination of uh, various uh, uh, technologies. Like uh, Julia is one of them. It involves machine learning. It involves computer vision. Computer vision is a very uh, important aspect there. Uh, they also use these Google smart glasses. Like there is this one application where uh, there are these uh, mechanics who are like not specialists, right? But they are uh, there's, there's laborers. There are all these contract laborers who do not know, like who do not know how to handle these special scenarios. So they have this uh, special Google glass, uh, and then like you know, there's a, a centralized uh, place where a specialist is. Uh, sitting and then he can see what's he can like you know the video is being streamed and then like he's giving back uh, instructions to this mechanic on what to do and all that's that's there but the next uh, what is being worked on is like you know the in the, um, it's like it's a repetitive uh, uh, set of scenarios what usually keeps happening so like we are building a machine learning or AI uh, platform like which uh, which does what the specialist does like we are doing a lot of image processing and based on whatever the images are captured like you know the algorithm itself suggests what has to be done to the uh, to this laborer who is working on the car that is one thing what they are working on. But the uh, current scenario which probably I will uh, walk you through is uh, where like on a daily basis Volkswagen gets requests from the cloud uh, for um, like daily around 800 cars has to roll out and then there will be around 10 variants of uh, different cars like you know there are various models and each model will have various variants right. So this information comes like in aggregated from like you know various uh, probably these showrooms and all. So like usually there are around requests for 800 cars 10 variants and then uh, so the planning is a very challenging task here right. So usually like you know what Volkswagen tells us is they spend 2 hours the first uh, 2 hours of the day is spent only in planning with around like you know thousands of people waiting at the gates and uh, they are still deciding okay which set of I mean, I, all, all these people are like you know contract uh, employers and then there are uh, these managers at Volkswagen tell us that they are a little bit difficult to handle and like you know their attendance their like you know punctuality is also not too regular. So in general sense like you know planning or project planning or like you know the uh, planning for the production life cycle is very challenging. So like we are uh, like this Asia engineering is providing some uh, smart solutions there in uh, where they are using a lot of uh, IoT uh, devices and uh, like a uh, vision machine learning all put together like you know they are uh, helping to optimize uh, that whole process. I forgot to put on the uh, machines and uh, so on. So like uh, 
they are using these genetic algorithms where you know the the, the toughest problem is like you know uh, to assign these contract people to assign these people at what time and then each employee should go or like each of these workers should go at which part of the uh, what line and then which machine and then they should be given restricted access to only those areas all those things like you know they have this RFID tags based like which controls their uh, movement and all those things uh, but the interesting part is what what's the underlying uh, algorithm which takes care of this uh, all this uh, assigning of these employees so like one approach was using genetic algorithms but for genetic algorithms we needed a rich uh, historical uh, data set so like you know which we since it's a pilot project like until we obtain some data is difficult to apply this genetic algorithms so like uh, i had suggested another uh, technique so like what i'm going to basically talk about is that particular technique you i mean all of you are uh, users of the technique it's called as like uh, i mean it's basically matrix factorizations um, now the technical term is collaborative filtering i'm sure like all of you use facebook linkedin and uh, like Amazon or like various, e I mean, these e e-commerce platforms where like uh, items are recommended to you. For example, in Facebook, you get uh, you get recommended with like whom you should add as friends. In LinkedIn, also connections. In uh, e-commerce, it is like you know what other products you need to buy. So like this underlying whatever is called as recommender systems, right? So I'll just give a little bit. A peek into what uh, how recommender systems work and like for this particular scenario at Volkswagen how it is uh, useful uh, I don't think can people see so yeah, uh, why Julia? Julia is high level, high performance, dynamic programming language. Yeah, so she talked, covered most of these points. And what's a recommender system? Yeah, so user item interaction. Like we need to predict. For example, like you know, there are, uh, uh, I think I'll just take an example. Uh, so let's say there, like we, we want to come up with a movie recommender system. There are like four users and four movies, and then like people have watched those movies, and when they watch, they give the rating, right? Like Netflix, for example. So the question marks are like they haven't seen those movies, and it's our job to kind of uh, predict what that rating is, and if we will recommend that particular movie if like you know the rating is above a certain threshold value let's say it's about 3.5 or 4 we will recommend there's no point recommending if the prediction is like 1 or 2 right so that's how it works so this again is a jupiter notebook so like for example i've just uh, uh, consumed this data into julia so it's a matrix here r is a matrix it's a full matrix it's not a sparse one like so there are zeros here okay so like in very simple uh, technique, okay, now there's another example where let's say we, we are adding another user called as Gary and this is his la the, uh, it's the last row here and okay, so next I converted this into a sparse matrix. I don't need those uh, zero values, right? So like I converted into zero matrix and then I'm doing something called as an SVD factorization. So in essence what matrix factorization is uh, is here so like there are if there are m users and n items which is being uh, factorized into product of two matrix this one matrix is equal to product of two matrices so any guesses like i mean uh, you can also see that the inner dimension is k so it's just important to uh, get that the dimension of u u stands for users in this case m m stands for movies so we are factorizing one matrix 
which has information about both users along the rows and movies along the columns into two matrices u and m u only kind of characterizes the users and m characterizes the movies so how many like if you see in this a matrix there let's say there are n items so n movies m users so if you see the dimensions of u there it is m cross k and k cross n so like matrix multiplication it has to be m cross k into k cross n so the product is m cross n right so that uh, we achieve that using uh, what svd svd is like singular value decomposition uh, where is it here so you we get an u and then you also get something called as an s which consists of something called as singular values if you have heard about eigen value decomposition these are the eigen values and uh, u and v are the corresponding left and right eigen vectors this is one of the most standard and most widely used machine learning techniques it's also called uh, it goes by the name PCA principal component analysis eigen value decomposition matrix factorization collaborative filtering uh, i mean there are so many names but underneath it's the same matrix uh, computation what's uh, going on majority of the machine learning uh, algorithms revolve uh, around solving this particular equation so then we have r as a representation of that now let's make some predictions uh one second yeah let me run this oh sorry r and then we add another user and then i get a uh sparse sparse version of r and then let's do a reduced rank svd decomposition to get u s and v there you go and then let me reconstruct back r from u s and v so like when i decompose what i get is i get u s and v s and v combines into the second matrix let's say so in effect you have two matrices so when you multiply these two matrices what happens is magically all those places where there were zeros gets computed so those are your predictions and uh, like uh, when the data set is rich by rich i mean when you have certain minimum number of users and some minimum number of items and with each user like if there are some 20000 items like each user should have interacted with at least some 20 items you will get at 97 point or let's say 97% accuracy is what you can get using these techniques it's so simple but it will give you the best results you don't need to really break your head on anything like if your data set is follows this structure you can just this is the first thing you should be trying out so like uh yeah if you see r which was the older matrix see there's a zero here zero here zero 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 yeah this one probably it would have i i, I think i'm rounding off so something's happening there and it's a zero but otherwise things have got filled up uh yeah but unfortunately most of them are uh, the ratings are low itself so nothing to recommend here we have predicted values the values are 1 here one which is bad two which is bad and again one which is bad so no recommendations going here uh, you can try out this experiment probably what you can try out is is in the input matrix you can remove these fives you can just make them zeros and retain the rest of the matrix and predict you will get a higher rating there like you can just go through these notebooks and play around for yourself so in this way you can make uh, predictions so like uh, uh, there is this uh, data set called as movie lens data set which which has around like you know 20 million ratings uh, like for around 27 7000 movies and 138000 users so i've used this as a uh, standard data set for my experiments and uh, 
the results like you know when I finally made some when I modeled the whole thing and then I just randomly picked up some user okay and then I am doing all the un, uh, predictions and I have set some threshold of 4 and then like see I have just listed for clarity like you know the movies he has already watched. So, if you can just have a quick look you know there is this seems to I have also I, I just pulled out also what the genres these movies belong to just to give you a sense yeah. So, see what I mean there is some kind of a, a pattern here right this guy is a weird guy he, he likes drama romance and also he likes mystery thriller yeah, and horror and comedy yeah he is weird but whatever. Uh, so, yeah see there is a pattern 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 pattern, but mind you so these are like you know it has so many dimensions in them that like it is impossible for you to kind of write some hard rule based techniques here it is impossible. So, what the beauty of this mathematical uh, uh, for this thing technique that is SVD is it takes care of the which are the important dimensions. So, by dimensions what I mean is like you know if it is 138,000 cross uh, what was it 27,000 or 28,000 movies. So, the dimensions are very high there right. So, like there is no way you are going to select ok. So, there is a genre uh, feature here there is a comedy feature here. So, there is no way you can pick it up. So, the underlying math itself is doing all these things and then like when I said like you know there is this singular values right. So, the singular values are in a certain ascending order sorry descending order. So, like the uh, the higher the singular value means that that particular singular vector is the strongest characterizing feature for that particular user. So, you can decide there you can make predictions if you are not happy with the predictions what you can do is you can play around with how many of the singular values you are going to consider that is what happens in eigenvalue decomposition also. I hope uh, you are following oh, ok. So, ok let me let us see his uh, predictions ok. Yeah see this this was I mean this was this technique which did it the recommendations also you if you see there is a similar pattern right. We just pick the top 10 of his recommendations. It is uh, like uh, I mean you can just go and look at the code here there is no uh, any hard uh, rules embedded or there is no <laughs> such hacks involved. It is just like you know you just close your eyes uh, I mean decompose the matrix recompute and then pick the top 10 open your eyes you have this something like that. So, like most of I mean like I would suggest like even you can do this on yourself if you watched all all we need is you should have watched at, at least uh, 20 movies put your name in there or whatever another your thing is just another row vector below and then like you know your ratings to those movies recompute and you will have you you will know what movie to watch next. So, uh, how do I how do we relate ok why is this important to us? This is like you know when I talked about uh, I was talking initially about this Volkswagen problem where uh, there are these uh, there, where, where, where there is this uh, resource allocation problem right. So, the problem there is there are these uh, contract employees and then there are the skill sets that is one matrix formulation there itself right. So, like wherever like you know a particular employee ok and then there are like various uh, with whatever fields like he is a PCB expert, he is a lathe expert, he is a CNC expert all those things. So, values again you can put it as like on a scale of 1 to either you can it this works on binary data as well yes or no or on a certain uh, range within a certain range. So, you can just put values there and then you decompute like you know for uh, uh, let us say you are going to need some guy for some set of tasks you pick those tasks and then you decompute uh, I mean uh, from your reconstructed matrix it becomes easier for you to pick ok which employee do I need for these set of tasks and things like that. It is very easy uh, because 
as I said, like you know, genetic algorithms also works very well. But for genetic algorithms, I should have some kind of historical data based on his performance and things like that. For example, if you put some person X on some production line, how well did he do there? You need that data. But here, just like you know, in the CV or in his thing, you will get all the features. So it's like it's a way we could uh, so uh, solve our cold start problem. We will use this, if this works out well, this will continue, otherwise we will use the data which is collected from this thing and then we will bring in some advanced uh, AI or like any other genetic algorithms and things like that. So this is one uh, scenario what I wanted to talk about. So uh, <coughs> my colleague Nishant will just give a, a quick introduction on this platform Julia Box and how all of you can very easily start. Yeah, yeah, it's all there. It's in a package called as uh, my name is Abhijit CH or my handle is Abhijit CH on GitHub. So there it's called as Rexis, R E C S Y S dot G L. It's a package. It's 100% Julia and 100% open source. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> This is the package, that is the URL, A B H I J I T H C H. Sorry? I didn't get you. Zeno. Huh? What is that? About Julia? Uh, about Julia? Okay, so it's it's a language. As Shashi said, it's a it's a complete high level language and uh, how to get started with like when Nishan is going to talk about Julia Box. So it is a platform where all of you, I am sure all of you will have either Gmail ID, GitHub ID or LinkedIn ID or whatever. Using that credential you can log in and you can start programming right away. Nope, it is free. Julia Pro our product is also free. Even the commercial license is free. You can, yeah, or, or no, you can like another friendly version is uh, this product called as Julia Pro, which you can download from our company website juliacomputing.com, which is free, as I said again. Even for commercial thing, also it is free. Probably you will only have to pay for some support. Yeah. Julia Pro. I know, but it's free. It's free. Julia Pro is free. Okay, over to Nishant.